Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? We're used to sleek, slim laptops, but in the early days of mobile computing, they were anything but. This time, let's take a look at the first Mac that could go anywhere. Well, kinda. This is the aptly named Macintosh Portable. That's because with its size and weight, very few, if any, would ever want to use it on their lap. Its 15 inch by 15 inch footprint and weight of 16 pounds had many referring to it as a luggable computer. The kind of machine you wouldn't exactly be eager to carry around, but could if you needed to. And it was far from the only computer in that category. In 1989, when it was released, many other PC manufacturers were making machines that were just as bulky, if not more so. Thankfully, one at least got decent functionality out of the deal. The portable didn't skimp on connectivity. The back hosts a full complement of ports, including video, external floppy, SCSI, ADB, two serial ports, and audio out. There was also a provision for an internal 2400 baud modem, though this unit never got that upgrade. There's a handle at the front of the machine for carrying it around, which also doubles as the display latch. Push the handle in, then you can open the screen. The keyboard is surprisingly nice to type on. It features full-size keys and mechanical switches. Next to it is a trackball, which has a clever trick. You can unclip the bezel, disconnect the ribbon cables, and switch which side it's on. And if you preferred a mouse, the trackball could be removed entirely and replaced with a numeric keypad. Some luggable PCs use small CRT displays, but the Mac Portable went with an LCD panel instead. This has its pros and cons. It's a 9.8 inch screen with a resolution of 640 by 400, larger and higher res than contemporary all-in-one Macs like the SE30. It's monochrome and uses active matrix technology, so it's very sharp and offers smooth motion without blurring. The downside is that it didn't include a backlight. So just like a Game Boy screen, it was unusable in all but the best lighting conditions. The most common configuration included a single floppy drive and an internal 40 megabyte hard disk, though one could omit the latter to save some money and weight. There was also a dual floppy version of the portable, but information on it is exceedingly rare as are photos but you can see how the side of the rear cover is removable to accommodate a different faceplate with the extra disc slot. Going floppy only would have been annoying with the constant swapping of discs, but would have also helped the machine better live up to its name. That's because of the portable's battery life. It was rated as getting between 6 and 15 hours of runtime on a charge, and it all depended on if or how much you used that hard drive. Low power laptop drives as we know them today didn't really exist back then, so Apple and other manufacturers had to go with full-sized desktop drives. In the case of the portable, it was made by Connor. The machine was the first Mac with the ability to spin its hard drive down when not in use, which certainly helped to prolong battery life as did using a RAM disk, which Apple recommended. In fact, Apple recommended not really ever shutting the portable down completely. That's because it was also the first Mac to offer sleep mode, where it would preserve the contents of RAM while powering down other components. And the difference in standby power draw was negligible between sleep and shutdown states. When you went to use the computer again, though, it would wake from sleep much faster than a full boot, and consume less power when doing so. The user handbook included a helpful, though perhaps overly complex, chart illustrating what power-related steps you should take based on what action you needed to perform. And indeed, power is one of the portable's Achilles heels. 
it used a lead-acid battery, which was a major contributor to the machine's weight. It was also integral to the system, as the portable lacked modern power management. All voltage into the system flowed through the battery, even when it was connected to its AC adapter. If the battery was missing or dead, the computer couldn't turn on. These days, that's an especially big problem, as original batteries have long since failed and new ones aren't being manufactured. Thankfully, the retrocomputing cottage industry has stepped in to fill the gap. Some portable owners have rebuilt their batteries, while others have fabricated new ones using 3D printed enclosures, which had been done for this machine. But the battery is only half the problem. Like with many portable devices, over time the AC adapter can get separated from the computer and lost. Not just any ordinary adapter can be used, though. If fed too much current, the portable's rudimentary power management circuitry can be damaged. The original AC adapter handles power regulation and is limited to 1.5 amps, but later Apple laptop AC adapters, which some portable owners have turned to using, output 2 or 3 amps. There's a long-running belief that using one of these adapters is just fine with the portable, but that's not the case. Sure, it may work, but at great risk to the computer. And accordingly, when original adapters show up for sale online, they sell for high prices. Another problem is the hard drive. Like many other SCSI drives from the late 80s and early 90s, failures are increasingly common, but the unit in the portable isn't easily swapped. For some reason, Apple went with a custom 34-pin interface. The Retro Mac community has come to the rescue again, with an adapter that lets you connect any ordinary 50-pin SCSI drive, or a solid-state replacement like the Blue SCSI. Performance-wise, the portable features a 16 MHz Motorola 68000 processor, and this puts it about halfway between the original Mac SE from 1987 and the SE30, also from 1989. It shipped with 1 MB of RAM soldered to the motherboard, which wasn't quite enough to leave room for a sufficiently sized RAM disk. RAM upgrades, though, were more expensive than usual due to the use of so-called static RAM, or SRAM, which was more power efficient. A year after launch, third-party companies were able to bring prices down a bit. A 2 MB module cost $200 US, but to take the machine to its 9 megabyte maximum still cost a hefty 2600 bucks. The use of SRAM did allow for a neat trick though. In addition to its main battery, the portable used a standard 9 volt alkaline cell to power things like the system clock and a few persistent settings. But it could also keep the contents of RAM alive while the machine was asleep and the main battery was being swapped. Of course, carrying an extra battery or two would have worsened the machine's hefty weight even further, but Apple apparently did consider this as a feature that people would use, especially since the company offered a dedicated external battery charger. Beyond its luggable nature, there was another limiting factor to Mac portable sales, its price. A base model with only one floppy drive went for $6,500, and adding in that 40 megabyte hard drive brought the total to 7300. That was sufficiently expensive to practically ensure that only businesses would buy them, and only for the most hardcore of road warriors. The machine's size and weight was almost universally panned by reviewers, and while the screen's sharpness was impressive, the lack of a backlight was a major problem. One that Apple ended up fixing in a second revision of the model in early 1991. The computer was the same for the most part, but finally sported a crisp white backlit screen. While this rendered the machine significantly more usable, it also competed with the hard drive as the most power-hungry component, cutting battery life in half. The Macintosh Portable produced a mix of emotions for reviewers and Mac users alike. After design delays reportedly stretching back years, Apple had finally released a Mac for those on the go. 
It helped diversify Apple's product line beyond the cute compact Macs and professional desktop series. But it wasn't nearly as portable as some of the machines PC manufacturers were making, and it was much more expensive. Relatively few were sold, and it was an uncharacteristic flop for a company that, up until that point, had been quite successful. The machine was on the market for about two years before its discontinuation at the end of 1991, and what followed it righted all of the portable's wrongs. The PowerBook series put the Mac in a proper laptop form factor, with solid performance, a much more mobile and ergonomic design, and of course, backlit screens. The initial three PowerBook models were a big hit, and the Mac Portable quickly faded from memory. These days, Apple's notebooks are the most popular machines in the Mac lineup by a wide margin, and the company has placed special emphasis on minimizing their footprint and weight, a far cry from the Portable's luggable origins. And while the Portable never proved to be a popular machine, it did lay the groundwork for what was to come. Because, as they say, you have to start somewhere. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.